Welcome, everybody. I hope that the uh, earlier session was helpful to you, and uh, and we're excited to do this uh, to do this session where you actually get the chance to uh, drive most of it and ask questions and get expert opinions and input from our team over here. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, kind of ask our team to uh, to introduce itself. So I'll start with Chris. Chris, if you want to. Uh, uh, just give a brief introduction so that uh, our uh, participants kind of have an idea of where your uh, strengths lie, so to speak. Welcome, everybody. I'm Chris Jobsen from the Netherlands. Um, I'm working about 20 years in e-commerce now. Um, and actually, I grew with the market. And uh, MDM PIM was not part of, of the business 20 years ago. Uh, and gradually it, it became part of this environment. So about 10 years MDM and PIM uh, experience. I'm founder of PIMVendors.com platform. What I did is I worked for a lot of companies like Ahold, Staples International, several local supermarkets and international fashion brands. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, Dick, if you would introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah, as uh, Rob already introduced me, uh, I, I founded Perfion 18 years ago. And um, before that, I was also working with product information in another company. So, so that's kind of what fed uh, me the idea to, to start this company. Uh, so I had a lot of challenges working with product data uh, in, a, in a previous project. And uh, it's so long a time ago, there was nothing called PIM back then. I started using the term PIM, so I thought I invented PIM. Uh, I still think I do. I know there are probably a couple of other people in the world that think they did too. But uh, having been here for so long and done so many projects, uh, I think it's okay to, to say that. So, so self-declared founder of PIM. <laughs> Sounds good. Henrik. Hello, my name is Henrik Lindell, and uh, I'm a data management consultant and uh, have been that for more than uh, 25 years, uh, started focusing on data quality, went into MDM, data governance, and PIM after Dick invented it, I could think <laughs> it must have been. And uh, now I work as a consultant still. Uh, I also have a startup called Product Data Lake, which is a service for exchanging product information between manufacturers and merchants. Um, so that's the short one. Fantastic. And uh, my name is Tom Seeger. I'm a partner here at CoreShop Solutions, where we implement PIM and e-commerce solutions of, uh, of all types. I'll uh, moderate here today. Um, the best way to, uh, to, to work in your questions, and that's really the goal here, is for you guys to get to ask whatever it is that uh, is on your mind from our panelists or of our panelists. So uh, use the group chat, enter in your questions, and that'll be the easiest way for us to get those questions in front of our, uh, in front of our esteemed panelists. Um, but uh, just to maybe kick it off, let's, let's go do a little round robin and let's just define PIM. Uh, we've heard the term here bantered about, I'm sure, in the earlier session as well as here. But um, let's go reverse order, I guess. Henrik, you want to give that a shot? Yeah, I can say that. For, for me, PIM is a data management discipline which is aiming at the long tail of product information uh, that you have. And, and the main goal is to uh, support buying decisions. And that predominantly is self-service buying decisions, which we know from, from e-commerce and, and other scenarios where you do self-service. That's a pretty good definition there, I think. Is there something, uh, Chris or Dick, that you may want to add? I think PIM is a customer-facing environment. So what Enric said, um, it's about buying decisions. Um, it's about the customer wanting of need to, to see some information of a product. And this customer is a very diverse uh, is not a person, not just a person. It can be a marketplace, it can be a e-com environment, it can be a catalog or a brochure. Every um, output channel needs to have information which can be provided by a PIM system. Yeah, 
It is definitely, I would also say customer facing, uh, marketing, sales, uh, because you also have other systems called PDM, which more have an, an intern, internal development uh, technical focus. Uh, so PIM is driving uh, the information for the market. Um, so that's also, also why uh, sometimes you speak about BAM, is, is that PIM also? In, in my mind, uh, well, not, not I guess all PIM think about DAM, but in my mind, DAM is in many cases, at least when you're working with product data, just a subset of, of the product information and should actually be an integral part of a PIM system. And when you talk about PIM, uh, you can also, we talk about product data, but, but you, we're also talking about managing all of this data for many different platforms, output platforms. So this also means you need to be able to manage many different hierarchies so that you can support assortments for many different platforms. You can, you can, you can uh, for example, as Trish, uh, no, it was, uh, uh, it wasn't Trish that said it, but 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 you you don't have to necessarily put put all of your assortment on on Amazon. You you may want to uh, define what you want to put in different channels, what you want on your own key e-commerce e system, or maybe you have multiple e-commerce systems. What you what you want to present on on Amazon. So this means you end up uh, managing multiple hierarchies, and you also end up managing information that you might want to differentiate your your content or branding to different platforms. So PIM is a lot more, in my mind, than just the actual product data itself. It's also a lot of other entities uh, that you need to relate your products to and even relate products to one another, uh, spare parts or, or, or product sets. Um, yeah, and then we, we, we could, of course, start talking about what is MDM then, because this term is also used a lot in, in this perspective. And ma well, the term means master data management, and one of the disciplines is for product data, but MDM really encompasses all kinds of data, and Perfion can manage all kinds of data. Uh, so, so it is effectively an MDM system. Um, uh, but, but when you're talking about MDM, uh, you can, in, in my mind, if you're a really big company, you might want an MDM uh, because you want to feed and up to and keep other systems in the organization up to date but if you're not you know boeing or someone else then in my mind mdm does not necessarily have to just be one system i mean perfect is so flexible it could handle all kinds of data but that doesn't mean that you want to do it that way i i think mdm in that perspective could be be spread across multiple systems for example your erp system which is transactional should really be focusing on the prices and handling inventories and and and, and what's in, in stock and and the PIM shouldn't be doing that i know some customers will say well we want to do it there anyway uh but but i would say 95 percent of our customers decide to use the erp system to manage the information it's built for so then the erp system becomes one small part of the mdm solution and together all of these systems the PIM. And, and the ERP can form the MDM system in most companies, unless you're Boeing or other huge companies. I think MDM and PIM, the big difference is that M MDM is inside your company, inside, and PIM is customer facing. That's the main difference. And PIM and ERP, it's like a marriage. They, all, they, they belong to each other. You, you can't have a PIM without an ERP. It's it always, um, it's, it's joined together and you have to make uh, good um, uh, decisions. What do you do in what environment? Who is responsible for a certain kind of data? Mm. Who's responsible for other data? I think that's the governing part of the, in, within the organization, which is very important. And it's not just the technical system, but it's about govern, governance. It's about who is doing what, who's responsible for what? I'm glad you brought that up. And I think just for the purposes of making sure everybody here is kind of on the same page listening, let's define the, the terms a little bit. ERP is enterprise resource planning. Um, these are the tools that you guys are probably using in your company already to do everything that is financial, that is related to, um, you know, 
uh, billing your invoicing, collecting invoices, which is the financial aspect of it. It may also be involved in the manufacturing and distribution process. Where are your, uh, where are your products located in your warehouses? All of those kinds of things kind of fall under enterprise resource planning. Um, dam, which was mentioned, and, and I'm glad that was brought up because it's very important, is the digital asset management. These are the pretty things, right? The pictures, the videos, um, possibly the guides as to how to put something together that go alongside your product and that make your product um, come to life for people. And particularly now in these times when uh, a lot of people are having to buy the goods that they want online, the more of that kind of information that you can share with people, uh, the more valuable it becomes. So that's the digital asset management piece that, uh, that Dick spoke about. And then of course, there's the uh, PIM itself, which is product information management. And I loved your description, uh, Chris, of that's really, how do I describe my product to my prospects? How do I externally describe it? Because most of these ERP systems have descriptions of your products, but they're not descriptions that would cause anybody to buy it. <laughs> so, so I think that's really where, uh, where PIM comes into play. Yeah, yeah, but even more importantly, um, uh, most ERP systems handle descriptions. And yes, sometimes they're made by, by a, a finance person that uses internal uh, short codes so he can quickly identify what the product is, but it would not make sense to the customer to read it. But in addition to, to, uh, to just the description, you, you need a lot of other information about your products out there for your customers to find your products and, and uh, find out which product to buy. And if, that, if they can't find that information online, as we heard earlier, um, most of the, seven, over 75% or the 60% of the buying decision is already made online. And, and it's made based on that information that they're able to find. So you need to ad hoc be able to quickly add new attributes, images, multiple images, videos, any kind of data ad hoc to your product that, that will help your customers so that you can win your customers. If you can't do that, then, then you're not able to act in the market. That's definitely a, uh, a key piece. And so, and so how would you go about um, determining in your organization what do I handle inside of a PIM? What do I handle inside of the ERP? What do I handle inside of the, the digital asset management, which is often combined with the PIM solution? How do I kind of make those decisions in, uh, in your minds? Well, in my and mind, it's, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, I always think about what is an ERP system built for? I don't know, ERP is, is all encompassing almost in its definition. But, but, um, but it's really about transactions. It's, it's about inventories uh, and, and, and writing invoices, keeping track of all, all the finances in your company. And, and that's what it's, it's built for. That's what it's good for. So, so any data that's transactional, you should leave in, in the ERP system. And, and all of the other data that you need in order to convince the customers to buy your products, images, descriptions, CO data, uh, multiple videos and files, put that in your PIM system, and then then just link them together. In Perfion, we we have something we call remote uh, links, where you can just set up uh, live connections to data in other systems that are managed in other systems, and then they become part of that single source of truth, so that you you have when you ask Perfume for the information, it doesn't really matter where it is or, or who is the master of the data, you will get it all out of there. So, so that's how I would split it up. And when it comes to dam, uh, we can do uh, all of the dam and Perfume also, but, but there could be reasons that you might want to still have a separate uh, dam. Uh, but before we go into that, let me just give Chris and Henrik a chance also to uh, let, let's jump to Henrik as, as he hasn't gotten a lot of words in here yet. Um, uh, Henrik, how do you see all of this sort of benefiting uh, the customer in the end? How, how, how do they benefit business-wise from this? 
on this yeah so so what we always already have been talking about is that you have this central repository of product information that you gather and, and we heard that very much from the citizen case uh, and that that what they did another reason of being for for pim is that uh, products aren't aren't created equal so products needs different uh, specifications so so if you have a power tool that needs to know something about voltage and this stuff if you have a, a hand tool it's some other specifications that are in focus so actually handle these different uh, attributes as we call them you need for for different products that's also a great reason of being for product information management uh, systems and the best of them they are able to allow the super user to actually define what 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 kind of information that's needed for the different product groups and and to do that uh, there's also a, a need to manage hierarchies and classification so we so we know what product we are talking about um, so that's that, that's another benefit of the product information management systems it all depends uh, on 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 how well a pim is implemented because um, one, of the, one of the aspects, you need to s serve different output channels. They all have their own, their, their own needs uh, according to the, the, regarding to, to, to data. Um, when you have your product data at the, the, the lowest granular level, you can always uh, compose the output the way you want and you're not stuck in, into the system. We need another attribute because the information is there, only you can put things together in, in an output uh, uh, structure and another output structure needs different ways of, of composing the, the, the data. But the granular level must be available. Let, let me encourage once again, so this, this session is really for for uh, the folks that are listening in here uh, to ask questions and to, uh, and to come up with the, the things that might be important to you. So let me just encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of the chat uh, and, uh, and enter in your questions so that we can get those in front of the folks. And I, I have one that just, that just came through. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask it, and that is, uh, why is the data not enough for e-commerce? So I'm not 100% sure um, what you mean by that. I'm guessing the ERP data. Um, why is it not enough for e-commerce? Uh, uh, Henrik, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, e-commerce needs a lot of different data uh, for multiple purposes, actually. So, so think, think of the way the customer uh, can find the product. He can do that in many different ways. He can drill down your website to, uh, into categories and subcategories and stuff like that. So you need data to support these hierarchies so you can drill down. Another way of finding things is filtering. So he wants to, the customer wants to filter on different parameters, could be colors, could be sizes, could be brands, could be a lot of things. So you always also need data to support filtering. You also need data to support searching. Uh, some customers for some scenarios, uh, they search directly for the product in mind. And you need your data also to be able to be catched by these search. So, so the, the customer reaches your customer fairly easily uh, because what the, the most easy thing, if you can't do that, that's to continue to the next web shop and you don't want that to happen. So, and, and uh, Dick, if you could chime in as well, but a little more specifically, while that was being asked, I got another question and that question was specifically around dynamics. So we have a customer yeah. that uses dynamics um, today and, uh, and wants to know if that can handle their e-commerce. Well, basically e-commerce, as soon as you have a SKU and you have a, a price and shopping basket, then you could have an e-commerce system. But question is, is whether, is that enough to, to make your customer buy from you? Because that's essentially what it all comes down to. You want your customers to buy from you. And, and the ERP systems, um, uh, what, what you have to think about with your products is also that you continually introduce new products 
you also introduce new information to these products that you need to manage. So you need a flexible PIM system where you can, where you can fast add new types of attributes and features, and then they will immediately turn up on your website. And, and, uh, and then you also need to think about that maybe, maybe you just have one website, but, but we also heard earlier, you know, the world is getting more complex. You, you won't tomorrow just have one website. You will have maybe your B2B website. You will also have some of you at a B2C uh, website, or you will, will create campaigns. You will, you will uh, feed your data to, to Amazon, eBay, or many other uh, different uh, retailers uh, that are out there. And, and in order to do that, you need a, a PIM system. The ERP system is not built for that. Uh, we, we have standard connectors out of the box with these systems. So, so yes, you can do everything in an ERP if you want to. Uh, I know in Dynamics, you're used to calling developers and, and adding new fields, custom fields, and developing it. And if you do that and, and you think that's enough, uh, well, you can go ahead and do that. But, but eventually, uh, down the road, you will also want to upgrade your ERP system to a new ERP system. And then some of those customizations you'll have to pay for again to lift them to the new version. So, uh, so I'm not saying it's not possible. Uh, but, but down the line, it's going to be a lot more cost effective. You're going to get a lot more benefit uh, out of this if, if you do it in the right way. Yeah. Also, the benefit of, of having a PIM system is that it's, you have one version of the truth. It's what Dick already said. But what does it mean? Uh, everybody in your organization works on the same product, the same view of the product. So you don't have all this kind of misunderstanding of Excel sheets going back and forth and version, versioning problems and things like that. You're working on the same product and you can define who is working on certain parts of this product. So if this product grows within your PIM system, to give you an example, uh, I, I worked with a customer and um, there was a, 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 what does a PIM cost? Well, what does it cost to have a failure in your product data? Well, we, we discovered that there are a lot of things calculated in the cost of a, of, a, of, a, of a failure in your product data. We have to, uh, we have to discover uh, this, um, a ticket is made, the impact is analyzed. Uh, we have to look in several systems and processes. The issues have to be fixed and tested. So one failure in, pro in product data costs about 400 euro or dollar. But it's, it's huge. You don't think about this uh, right, uh, right away, but it really uh, saves you a lot of money when you're working on one version of the truth. And that's very important within a PIM. Yeah, that makes sense. We, we have another question here that, uh, that came in, which is, can the PIM also handle product specific per serial number documentation, such as a test certificate, for instance? Yeah. Yeah, you can create any number of attributes and features to handle any number of different uh, data sheets. You can name them all differently. You can, you can put them all in, in, in one container. So it, it's totally flexible in, in how it's set up. And I think that's what, what Trish was pointing to earlier also, um, although I, I was not personally involved in, in the implementation with Citizen. Uh, uh, but, but it's so flexible that when you ad hoc come up with new ideas, or we need to manage this or that, then, uh, then you, you can just create it uh, and drag and drop it into the system without coding anything. And then, then it's there and you can start using it. And one, one thing that, that when that question is probably also that, that usually what we work with in, in product information, then that's product model. So it's, it's at a, a giving model of a bus going machine or whatever. But actually there's a tendency to, to that you also want to handle each instance of that product. That, that very uh, screwing machine there, which is becoming intelligent and stuff like that, or you have some certificates that apply only to one instance of that product. And, 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 and we also see the best product information management systems they are able to handle these things that we can call assets or instances of the product. 
uh, or what we want to call them. I don't know if this is going to be important to the folks here or not, but it just occurred to me that a number of times now we've used the word attribute. Uh, and I just want to make sure that when we use a word that we define it so that uh, some folks that are attending may or may not know what we're referring to. Uh, could you just uh, each give kind of your brief definition of what an attribute is? So an attribute, that's a discrete data element. So that may, might be the color of that product. It might be the, the gross weight of that product, or it might be um, the length of that product and any kind of product information that you need for this kind of product. Any specific data element that handles uh, uh, that information. Perfect. Uh, and, and Chris, any, any additional thoughts around attributes or maybe taking that maybe now a step yeah. further and what do you I actually think, do with them? Yeah, when, when, you, when you talk about an attribute, well, you talk about one attribute, but products can have hundreds of attributes. And part of them, uh, they're like measure, it's, it's the same throughout all languages, but when you have descriptions, uh, and you have a multilingual uh, uh, public, you need to translate it into maybe six, seven, eight, nine languages. And then it becomes really uh, hard to manage all this when you don't have a PIN system. Uh, so the, the numbers, they matter uh, when, uh, the, when you have to make a decision if you need a PIN system, yes or no. Because when you have 200 products and you have three languages, and there's one person ma uh, maintaining these products, okay, that's fine, you can do this with Excel, but when it's, when it's going to multiply, then you really need to have uh, a more sophisticated uh, environment to, to manage this. Great. We, we, we actually started in Perfion, instead of calling it attributes, we call it features. So, so thinking about features of a product, uh, what the product does, uh, because an attribute, you often just think about some kind of technical attribute like a height, width, a length, or a color option. But with a feature, it can be anything. It can be descriptions in all languages. It can be files. It can be images, and photos, uh, audio files, documents. So, so in Perfume, we call it features, and it, it covers any kind of information that, that you want to attach to anything. And, and that could be the product, but it could also be any other entity. Uh, that you want to attribute or put more features on. Fantastic. So we have a follow-up question to the earlier question um, around documentation per serial number for, for instance, test certificates. And that question is, can, can this be automated? Assigning a test certificate with a serial number to the correct product instance serial number in the PIM. So can that be an automated thing? Yeah. Definitely, everything can be automated. There, there are APIs. We also, well, in, in Perfion specifically, we have something called actions that you can define to, to handle all kinds of automation jobs, uh, anything from exporting data in, in different formats or something like uh, the case you just mentioned here. About automation, for instance, um, images and uh, videos also can be automated, connection, make, make connection to the product as long as, as there is something, some kind of key where you can, uh, where you can relate to. So automation is something that's certainly probably key to a lot of folks, I would think, uh, simply because particularly if you're dealing with an, a, a lot of products and some companies, at least that we've worked with, are in the millions of products, um, having to do things by hand becomes uh, becomes pretty difficult. So being able to automate as much of the uh, process as possible uh, becomes sort of a key element for them. Uh, it looks like I've got another question here, which is what kinds of data have you experienced as being the hardest to find? I think the question evolves into, if I don't have the data already somewhere that I want to put into the PIM, um, you know, how can the PIM help me? In other words, it's not in my ERP already. I don't have it, um, you know, in some sort of electronic format. Um, yeah. 
And, and that's, yeah. that, 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 then we come back to, to what, what Trish also mentioned during her implementation that where do we start with all of this? They had 11 different systems. I bet they probably had a lot of people that had all, some of all of this stuff in the, walking around in their heads as well. And that was the only place it existed. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Trish, uh, assuming this, but, but I've seen that in many other places. So, so uh, how do you start with this? And, and, and the interesting thing here is um, you can sit down and you can do a lot of workshops and you can define everything up front. But the problem with that is, uh, is that, that the world changes all the time. The world is dynamic. Your product changes. Everything changes. So once you're finished with that specification and that workshop and you develop all your customizations, because that's what you're used to in ERP systems and, and other systems, well, the world has changed and your system is not uh, working in the way that you wanted it to. So there is really, and, and, and maybe Chris and, and Henrik will shoot me for saying this, but I, I, I think there is only one real approach here and then and this drop all that stuff and just get started. I mean, load as much in there as you have right now, because then at least you are where you are today and then you can start moving forward and then take one chunk at a time and, and, and gradually make it better and add the stuff that you think of ad hoc because the system is built, Perfect is built to be dynamic and flexible so you can ad hoc, add new stuff. You can remove some of the old stuff and put some new stuff in there and replace it with new stuff. And, and that's the way we prefer to do implementations. It's not always the way all customers choose to do it, but those, those are the, the, the ways that, that, that I prefer and I think we have the best experience in doing it that way. And I've been dying to chime in if I can have a minute. I think that, you know, Dick, you're exactly right. And if you don't mind me chiming in, because I, I've been on mute, but yeah, exactly that. If, if, the da if you need the data, it exists somewhere. Maybe it's not in the ERP. Maybe it's in somebody's spreadsheet on their computer that they, you know, take on the subway every day home and they might get lost someday. But yeah, the data does exist. If you need it, it exists somewhere. And this goes back to us being able to like for, for citizen to be able to upload data through a, a spreadsheet. So if you need the information, um, you do have to produce it. You have to find it from somewhere and you do need to then just, it's easy enough just to get it back into Perfion and so that that remains your, your system of um, record. Well, once the data is in there, you, you, you can work with it and, and do things with it what you want. And uh, maybe you, have, you need to have some gate, uh, gatekeeper in front to, so you can, can have a kind of cleansing before you uh, enter data because that's the most, uh, most efficient way, I think. But when the data is in your system, you can look at it, you can compare things, you can work with, with the data and, and go from, from there. So in short, you're not going to shoot Dick. Oh, he's giving a lot of warning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but 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 it's true. It's true too, and and we, we that, that's also what we call the data lake um, approach, which is to 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 gather these data and then then actually make some decisions around them when when you actually use them and and. Uh, I think it's it's with the modern technology that's it's emerging around that, that that this data lake uh, concept, which were which actually were, was sh shut down twenty years ago, it actually has some legs to go on today. Uh -huh. yeah. So, yeah. so simply get started, because if you don't get started, you'll never get started. <laughs> that's a that's a good well, point. What we say at Citizen is, how do you eat an elephant? It's a bite at a time. Right, and that's what we do. We always talk about it. it. Looks overwhelming to start, but you have to just start chipping away and eat an elephant a bite at a time. Yeah, and that's why it's so extremely important with a flexible system that allows you to do that. Uh, so stay away from customizations because they will lock you down. Yep, yep. That's probably a very important message and something to to keep in mind. And Trish, thank you for uh, for jumping in. Uh, and sharing your thoughts, because if I were on this webinar listening in, uh, the most important people I can hear from are actually customers that have done something uh, with, with PIM and, and have insight from that perspective. I do have a, this one looks like pretty much a direct question for you, Dick, because it's about Perfion, and that is 
any plans or work on bringing AI into Perfion PIM? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, um, I, you know, I, I could say, think of several things and uh, not that I want to share a lot of ideas here, but, but, but um, one of the, the big things that I've seen during this, these implementation projects is really when, when you have some data and your structures are wrong, often customers today, they have a structure from some kind of output and they've defined their products and their, their data around maybe a printed catalog or something else. But that's not necessarily where you want to place and uh, your products and show them to your customers not, not doesn't say anything about what features and attributes are relevant for them. So uh, you know, one of my ideas, I'm not saying it's going to come in the next version or anything like that, but we, we have uh, started working a little bit on it, uh, is, is to do some kind of automatic um, you know, uh, analysis and, and, and deductions based on that data to automatically create structures that are relevant so that instead of spending time figuring out what belongs together and what should be grouped together, then simply let, let uh, the system figure that stuff out by, by its own because that could save enormous times in, in this process. Um, and obviously, if we, we talk about AI, um, it, it, there, there could also be, be things, but that, that's less related to PIM and more, maybe more related to, to the e-commerce, is trying to deduct buying behaviors uh, but, but that's not in the PIM system. That's more on the front end, but you could definitely maybe feed some of that information back into the PIM and then use it for other channels. Um, but I don't see that as, as an AI in the PIM. How about, uh, but, but I, I'm very open to hear ideas from anyone because we're always looking for good ideas to, to bring forward. To, to improve the product. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course, yeah. 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 Henrik, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just say say some of the most common scenarios about AI and PIM out there is, of course, the question of product classification that you want the system to classify products because that's 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 uh, often an Achilles heel in, in in doing automation and and speed to market. That is actually is to classify products and, and as a lot of people around working with with using machine learning and uh, AI to do this product classification. There's a question about mapping between uh, different classification, a classification you have at a manufacturer and the classification you have at the versions. So actually doing the mapping between these two uh, structures, uh, AI can be used for that as well. And then as you also touched, uh, Dick, that, that you know this uh, hype around uh, personalization of product data and things like that like to combine product information with the customer behavior with the, with the customer profiles and stuff like that and do AI to actually present the right information to the right customer at the right town and time in the right circumstances. That's, that's a job for AI too. It sounds like the, there's uh, several identified use cases yeah. for sure for, uh, yeah. for AI in the, uh, in the PIM process. Anything you'd like to add to that, Chris? Well, actually, that this is the, 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 the thing I, I see also with other PIM systems that the auto classification uh, issue, uh, especially when you're working in, in, in long tail, it's not really B2B, but uh, when you have long tail strategy as a, as a company, you don't want to manually touch every product uh, before it's going out. It, it, it goes out to the e-com sites or your, your marketplaces or whatever. So one of the things that, that I wanted to maybe have us address a little bit on this while I wait for some additional questions is, um, it, it's kind of related to ROI. So in other words, um, what can I expect in terms of return on investment for putting a PIM together in things like labor costs, in things like uh, the ability to sell more of my product, and, and thinking about PIM for e-commerce, certainly, but also beyond that as a vehicle to do print advertising, as a vehicle to um, 
to put out potentially catalogs, all of the things sort of associated with PIM. How, how meaningful is this from a, in other words, what's my business benefit? So we've talked a lot about the technology, what the technology allows me to do, but at the end, um, what I'm sure most of the folks on this call are really interested in is, does that get me anything, right? Do I make more money or save some money by doing this? So let's just start with Chris and, and let's have all three of you kind of address that here um, uh, as we go through it. One of, one of the big savings can be when you have to produce a catalog. Um, either in print or PDF or whatever catalog, because uh, when, when, you, when you do this DTP uh, uh, actions manually, it costs enormous amount of time and it will reduce significantly when you do this with, with a PIM. It's based on the structure you build for the output of this catalog. And it even can be used for a catalog catalog on demand or a catalog speci specifically for a, a customer, uh, a sp specific customer. So that's one of the things you can earn a lot of money uh, using a PIM. Dick? Yeah, I mean, obviously there are many, many cost savings you could benefit from a PIM, just like Chris said. But, but I think actually the, the biggest wins of a PIM is on the sales side. It's much harder to quantify, um, but, but just um, uh, as we, we heard earlier, if customers can't find the information on your web shop that they need in order to buy the product, they will go somewhere else. So you don't even know today how much business you're losing. It's very hard to quantify. Um, but, but also just think of, imagine if you have a PIM and you can start working internally when you're developing new products, you can start working in parallel. Your marketing department can start uh, preparing uh, all the templates and everything you need for your, for your output and have everything ready there. You can have people working in parallel on your product information so that, that, that you can get your, your products to market faster and, and if you just conservatively uh, could, could maybe add, increase the lifespan of your product by 2% just by speeding that process up, that would increase your, your revenue uh, tremendously. And, and you, that would pay for your PIM system multiple times. Uh, but, it, but in order to, to do that, well, if, if you just think about that calculation alone, uh, that, that, will, that will pay for multiple times. But, but this means that then you should actually have a system that is fast to implement. You can't work for two years to get it implemented. It needs to go fast because be, before you don't get the return on investment before it, it's, it's out there and, and running. Uh, and also it needs to be this flexible so it can support because it, that's the same thing, thing. If you do customizations, then you, you're not able to support changes along the way because your products change, new products come with new features and attributes. Uh, so, so all your system needs to be fast to implement and it needs to be able to accommodate those changes along the way. That's how you get the benefit on, on the sales side. And in addition to that, obviously, you can support the data from multiple channels, meaning more markets for you, multiple languages. A lot of businesses in the US are not uh, selling uh, abroad and don't manage a lot of languages, but they could have a huge potential in, in selling to other countries. I know that's a big decision. So there are many wins and I've never seen anyone get fired in a company because of cost savings, uh, but often cost savings are used to justify an investment like this. But I really think uh, the big wins are on the sales side. Okay. Henrik, anything you'd, yeah, you'd yeah, like to Yeah, I would, I would support these, these observations because the business cases I have followed, um, there have been cost savings and there have been labor, uh, labor resource savings and, and, and things like that. And, and in almost every situation that has been converted into more sales because then you use these resources to actually push more out through the sales channel and you can actually get a lot 
sales sales so if you use marketplaces sales if you use your own website if we, if we are the manufacturer and of course for manufacturers often also important to actually push product information to your resellers so the better product information your resellers has have on their websites from your product range the more your product range would sell the more you will sell more compared to your competitors and then that's where it's it, it really cashes in so it sounds to me like the win is definitely there with pim from a business point of view i should have a number of ways in which i can uh, in which i can cost justify and actually get a uh, a significant return on my investment for uh, implementing PIM. Of course, I have to do the right things along the way. Yeah, there's but, two sides of, of, of ROI. So, so, so there's also the TCO side because the total cost of ownership. And, and of course, if you mess too much up with your PIM solution selection, your PIM implementation, your governance uh, around it, then the, the ROI will, will uh, decrease. So you also have to be good at that. Exactly. And similarly, the ROI can increase with, uh, and I think this is what you've alluded to, Dick, a number of times with uh, the faster I can actually bring some of this, if not yeah. all of it to market, the, the quicker I get at least some of that ROI to justify maybe future pieces of what yeah, I and when to you, do with it, and, right? And when you talk about uh, total cost of ownership, you also need to talk about multiple generations of your PIM system and upgrades and getting new functionality out of the PIM system. And that's one of our strong uh, things with, with Perfion also, that it's 100% standard backwards compatible, so you can upgrade it very fast. There's not, you, you don't have, uh, you know, huge costs and upgrading to new versions. So you can quickly get all the new functionality. That's really something you need to take into consideration too when, when, when you evaluate solutions like this, because the total cost over time can be huge for, for some solutions. Sure. And that, I think that also speaks to the idea of not over customizing either exactly. your PIM or your e-commerce solutions for that matter. Um, because the more customization you do, the the more difficult it becomes when you go down the upgrade path. And I've I've at least certainly in our business run into a lot of that with our uh, with our customers. I've got I've got one final question. We're running out of time, so I'm going to probably make this the last one. But let me read it. If I wanted to imp introduce PIM to my organization, who is the typical person role that uh, that that a PIM provider like Perfion would initially interface with? Hmm. Um, well, it depends on, on, um, on what you want that person to do. Is, is this a, a, a person, a decision maker? Is it because you want to, con, con, to convince someone to question, get money right? to finance the solution? Because yeah. then I would, I would go as high as, as possible. Uh, depending on the size of the company, you may need to go to, to the CEO of the company and, and present them the return on investment uh, or, or, or the arguments for, for the win for the company here. Um, and, and we can, you know, we can help with that. We, we can help with the arguments, uh, coming up with the arguments for you. Um, but definitely go to someone and, and talk about the money and what they get out of it, because otherwise it's, it's just going to be a nice talk. Yeah. So we found uh, also in our business and, and uh, we found that a lot of times this really does grow out of the marketing side of the house and the sales side of the house where they're most aware of the fact that the, that the information that they have easily accessible to convince customers to buy, whether that's online or offline, just isn't sufficient that they run into competitors that share more share more about their attributes share more about products that yeah. maybe work together with this product that have and, uh, and, more information so and there's there's no one piece. like the ceo in the company that has heard more excuses from everyone in the company why something hasn't happened so so <laughs> you can you can bet on that they know what challenges they have in the company to to make business so any final thoughts from Chris or Henrik on what you should do to get started um, 
with one of these projects? What's the, what's, you know, maybe in uh, just a couple of sentences, everybody, uh, a quick, if you want to get started with PIM, here's the first two things you ought to do. Just get started. Yeah. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's good. That's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, else, else, uh, try to articulate a vision and a mission for for what what it is that you're going to do. Uh, that that that's a good start. And 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 next one, build the right organization around uh, what 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 you have to do there, uh, both with IT, with business, with governance. Uh, probably also financial uh, support, so build the right organization it mixed and then then I will go with uh, Dick. Then, 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 then go get started all right <laughs> fantastic well i 'd like to thank our panelists i'm i 'm sure that uh, contact information for each of them is available i 'm certain uh, the folks listening in here have plenty of additional questions and uh, and i 'm sure that our panelists would love to have an opportunity to to get with you one-on-one -on -one and answer those more.